Election night 2016 not only brought us President-elect Donald Trump and the guarantee of a new Republican-controlled Congress, but on the state level, voters made their voices heard on a plethora of issues, including campaign finance reform, minimum wage, and right to work. What happens in right to work states is that um, the state legislature uh, says that if you are, you do not have to join a labor union if your employer has labor union work there, which means that all of the benefits that come along with the labor union um, don't go back into the union. So things like collective bargaining, things like better health care, uh, things that, you know, if you ask seven in 10 workers, they want to be a member of a labor union. Uh, currently, just one in 10 are a member of a labor union. So these right to work states, which exist in, there are 26 of them, mostly in the South, uh, have lower wages, they have less health care coverage, uh, overall lower quality of life in these right to work states. Two states, Alabama and Virginia, had right-to-work initiatives on their ballots. But hold on, both of these states are already right-to-work states. But that's not enough in Alabama and Virginia, just having these statutes on the books that say uh, you have the right to work. Uh, in Alabama and Virginia, they're trying to uh, cement their right-to-work status into their state constitution so they can never be overturned. That is exactly what will now happen in Alabama, as Amendment 8, as it was known, passed overwhelmingly. It was a different story in Virginia, however, as voters there defeated Constitutional Amendment 1 by a much narrower margin. Another Election Day issue important to American workers is the minimum wage. Colorado, Arizona, Washington State, and Maine all approved a raise in their state minimum wage by the year 2020, then cost of living increases after that. One state, however, South Dakota, actually sought to scale down the minimum wage for youth workers. Referendum 20 would have taken a dollar an hour away from workers under the age of 18. It did not pass. States and municipalities concerned over the influence of money in politics put a handful of campaign finance reform measures on their ballots, Howard County, Maryland being one of them. So in Howard County, we're working to pass through a ballot initiative, uh, creating a, a small donor incentive fund that will help match contributions uh, that are under $150. And that will be for candidates who choose not to take you know, big corporate money and not try to run campaigns based on, you know, how many millionaires or billionaires can give them checks, but instead opt in to take small contributions from people who live in, in Howard County. You know, so trying to return the power of our elections back to regular everyday people. That measure passed, and at the state level, South Dakota, Washington State, and California all had initiatives to attempt to rein in the influence of money on elections. So there's a group called Represent Us um, that has really come out um, against corruption and for public financing of elections and a lot of kind of electoral reforms that they'd like to see in, in multiple states and jurisdictions. And this year they're supporting two statewide initiatives, one in Washington and one in South Dakota. And the one in South Dakota in particular has gotten interesting because a group that is backed by the Koch brothers and other um, conservative heavyweight donors has come in and said, uh, we don't want this measure. The measure does a lot of different things. Um, it bans um, certain lobbyist gifts to politicians. It requires more disclosure for political gifts. And it also creates this system of public financing for elections using what are called democracy credits, where each voter would get a certain amount of money to give to a candidate of their choice. Um, the same, that's the same system that they're proposing in Washington as well. For the Real News Network in Baltimore, I'm Kim Brown.